Fia, Espresso Talk Today community. It's Amma Robin here. This month, I am greeting you with the term Alafia. And that means, in the Yoruba language, good health and peace. So, Alafia. And Akwaba to the Espresso Talk Today show. Welcome to the Espresso Talk Today show. Asante Sana for joining our Black Empowerment Podcast show. We are continuing with our April theme, which is Black Health. This month, our podcast show will focus on all different aspects of health and healing. Physical health, mental health, emotional health, spiritual health, And we are talking to medical doctors, some are specialists, public health specialists, psychologists, and traditional healers. They all have a place in health and healing. Remember, Black health is Black empowerment. Today's show focuses on heart health. The Espresso Talk Today team is meeting with Dr. Clyde Yancey. Dr. Yancey is a cardiologist, a researcher, and a scholar. And I'll tell you more about him in just a minute. This was our first meeting with Dr. Yancey and the Espresso Talk Today team had a lot of questions. Dr. Yancey was so grateful to spend a lot of time answering our questions. And we are bringing these answers to you today. Asante Sana, to Dr. Yancey for meeting with us today. Dr. Yancey also brings a wide range of knowledge and experience to this conversation about cardiology and promoting heart wellness, very important. So we're gonna tap into as much of that knowledge and experience as time permits. Mel will arrive in just a minute and then we'll get started. While we wait for my esteemed ECT team member, let me tell you a little bit about Dr. Clyde Yancey. Dr. Yancey is a cardiologist and professor of medicine, cardiology, and medical social sciences at Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine. He has previously served as the president of the American Heart Association and he remains its national spokesman. Dr. Yancey also serves as Vice Dean of Diversity and Inclusion. He is board certified in both internal medicine and cardiovascular disease and is a board and is a member of the Association of Black Cardiologists. Dr. Yancey's research focuses on heart health, heart transplantation, and ways to prevent heart failure. He's also going to share important information about heart health, and you definitely want to hear that part as well. Now, I did a little extra digging, and I found that Dr. Yancey's patients describe him as brilliant, compassionate, an excellent listener, and just an incredible human being. Wow. I mean, wow. (laughs) We really are lucky. And I admit... I was not a bit surprised. Mel and I had the exact same experience and assessment of Dr. Yancey, and we are privileged to have him join us on the show today. We originally contacted Dr. Yancey to discuss one of the deadliest and most disabling illnesses experienced by African Americans, heart failure. And yes, we did have a really informative discussion about heart failure and other cardiovascular diseases. But Dr. Yancey went far beyond the discussion of heart failure into areas where many doctors simply do not fear to go. Preventive medicine. Dr. Yancey will discuss the eight essential steps to heart health. And you definitely want to hear those steps and I am convinced you're going to want to follow them too. His courage and candor and, yes, his compassion were expressed throughout this discussion of some scary diseases like heart failure, but he really did take it, he really went so much farther than that. Okay, you know what? I'm going to stop here. You can hear it all for yourself. 
Mel has just arrived, so sit back, relax, grab an espresso or a cup of tea if that's your preference, and let's get started. Hey, Mel. Hi, Robin. How are you? I'm doing really well. How are you today? I am fantastic. <laughs> I can see that, and you always are. And as you can see, I am having an espresso with a very special guest. This is Dr. Clyde Yancey, professor and chief of cardiology at Northwestern University, Feinberg School of Medicine, among other positions, too, that he holds there. And you're going to hear about a lot of that. So I've already introduced Dr. Yancey to the Espresso Talk Today community, but Mel, please let me introduce Dr. Clyde Yancey. Hello, Dr. Yancey. He's so happy to meet you. Hello, Mel, and hello again, Robin. <laughs> How nice is it to have an opportunity to meet the both of you? And you have espresso, I have dark roast, so I'm <laughs> delighted to have this conversation with you. Thank you. We're so happy that you're with us, and welcome to the Espresso Talk Today podcast show, and Asante Sana for participating on this show. Thank you for being on the show. Oh, nice, thank you. Let's get, let's get going. Okay, we're fortunate to have you here. And let's see, I like to open the show, almost, almost, almost everything, with a quote. And in preparation for this show, I read a statement that you made in an address at the uh, annual meeting of the Heart Failure Society of America in 2019. You said, there are real differences in the experience that African-Americans have when they suffer heart failure. And that's quite a revealing statement to make. And I wonder if it also applies to cardiovascular disease in general and a stroke, but I'm gonna ask you about that in a minute. But that st statement does set the tone for today's show. Um, so it's so remarkable that you captured that statement because that statement is applicable to heart failure as a specific disease applicable to cardiovascular disease, but also it's uniquely applicable to health. And that statement is really anchored on over 25 years of my own investigation, research, observation, and writing. And so, if you will, you got to the bottom of the funnel very quickly. There were a lot of other data inputs that mattered here. But in the context with which that statement was made, there's been a disease entity about which many of us are aware, many family members for you, for me, particularly in the African-American community, have experienced this condition known as, heart, known as heart failure. And in a more global sense, when we think about heart disease in particular, we are aware that many of the published data points from all over the world describe a very different experience of health and disease as a function of race or ethnicity, but importantly, not necessarily because of race or ethnicity. Let me be clear about that. What I'm suggesting to you is that there are crude descriptors of the patient experience that are approximated to race or ethnicity, being black or non-black, being Hispanic, non-Hispanic, etc. But what we have devolved at this point in our understanding of disease is that very little, maybe even zero of the root cause of those differences in disease are uniquely attributable to race. So this gets us to the singular concept that really drives contemporary discussions about race-based experiences in health and race-based experiences in medicine. That is to say that race is limited to the social construct, that is the life and living experiences that impact one's health and as well, or in turn, the disease state. But there is very little about race per se that causes the disease. That's a step forward because not so long ago, the very common statements were, or blacks suffer disproportionately from this, or blacks have this condition, or blacks are at greater risk. We recognized then that that language per se was using race as a very crude, indistinct placeholder for something that was more pertinent in understanding the genesis of the disease. 
Now, I'll stop my comment here because we need to have a longer discussion about this, but I'll just say that when we think about this history of race-based medicine, we can partition that history into the very small amount of health and disease that is related to our individual ancestry. And I say our because I am an African-American self-described professional. So to the extent that we track our ancestry to African heritage, then there is a small amount of disease that may be associated with African heritage. Beyond that, everything else becomes either a recognized contributor to disease like obesity, diabetes, hypertension, and behaviors like smoking or physical inactivity, or they're related uniquely, and this is where the conversations become awkward for some, but uniquely to the inequity in life and living, to the bias in life and living, to the structural systemic barriers to the attributes necessary for health and necessary to avoid disease. And some would approximate all of that to the underlying presence of structural racism, which has been present in the United States now for centuries, and is still evident today that there is some residual effect. There's a lot of argument in this country about this latter concept, and there are those that stridently push back but the data speak differently. So that's a long preamble to say that for a variety of reasons, there are differences in the way in which persons that are self-described as African-American experience disease and or acquire health. But those differences are driven by a number of very important complexities. Hmm. So, so basically you're saying that race and racial stress or racism uh, those are different factors, and, and we experience them, them differently. Of course, we you know race is, is the way it, it is, but racial stress can be a risk factor for uh, the for heart failure and other diseases like cardiovascular and stroke. So, Mel, I like the way you're going with this because it's the latter that not only is the more pertinent discussion, but it's the more actionable discussion. Mm -hmm. Race is a convenience sample. It is a labeling of individuals according to a socially derived model. Mm -hmm. To think that skin color infers a sameness in biology when one understands that skin color is the amalgam of so many different inputs, meaning to say so much intermarriage. Think about persons that are from the Caribbean. Think about persons that are from South America. Think about persons that are from Africa and different regions of the continent of Africa. Africa is not a country, it's a continent. And so you begin to understand that it would be very, very difficult to invoke a certain sameness in biology just because of skin color. However, the way in which groups have been treated systemically over the last two centuries changes that narrative whether it's the perpetual experience of persons that have a history of having been enslaved, living in communities where slavery was deeply in, infested, if you will, in those communities, whether it's persons whose acculturation included an environment where segregation was active, whether it's persons in a more recent time era who were living in communities that were disinvested, not invested, but disinvested because of the disproportionate clustering of certain groups of patients that were patients, I'm a physician, people that were not favored by municipalities, by public policy. So it's, it's a very careful discussion. But what we've learned over time is that because of your life and living circumstances and all the things that go into that, economics, access to healthy living, to safe living, education, transportation, all of those things that, if you will, are the floor of life. You understand that some people have a solid foundation of life mm -hmm. and some people have a wobbly foundation of life. Yeah. And that has much more bearing on health than we've ever appreciated. I can make this even simpler. 
turns out that your zip code now is as important as your genetic code when we're thinking about health and disease. Wow, wow. Um, can, uh, I, we, I know we want to continue on with this, this, and this is really important, but I think we need to back up a little bit, okay, because maybe we did start at the bottom of the funnel. Um, what is... How would, what is cardiovascular disease? And heart failure is a scary term to hear. Can you explain that too, doctor? So let me deconstruct that because both of your observations are, are necessarily um, re a requirement for us to further expand. So cardiovascular disease continues to be the leading cause of death and, and death and disability in industrialized countries. Mm. That is because of our Western lifestyles, which are predominant throughout industrialized countries. So that reflects um, the convenience of food prepared outside of the home. That reflects the ubiquity of certain lifestyle choices, smoking, physical inactivity. It reflects the burden that appears to be not ending of obesity and along with that diabetes these are characteristics of a western lifestyle the consequence of that lifestyle then is a predisposition it's a word we like to use in medicine but from a lay perspective it means a vulnerability to developing diseases of your blood vessels i want to be very clear that i said diseases of your blood vessels because that really qualifies the next statement, whether it's heart disease, brain disease, or kidney disease, it all starts with this risk factor burden with a slight upload from your genetic ancestry, but it starts with this risk factor burden. That then leads to a greater likelihood of stroke in certain communities a greater likelihood of heart disease, heart attacks, and heart failure, the two are not the same, and a greater likelihood of chronic kidney disease. So when you begin to think about this deconstructed view of the burden and understand that it tracks primarily the lifestyle, so much so that we can emphatically state that 80% of cardiovascular disease, regardless of the person, black, white, European, American doesn't matter, 80% is ostensibly preventable. That's how important lifestyle is in this conversation. So then as we move over into the second part of your question, that is thinking about heart failure per se, you know, Robin, let me give you a, a shout out and two thumbs up because you articulated with so many patients now that I see are afraid to articulate. Heart failure is a scary term. If I told you you had kidney failure, a bone marrow failure, or lung failure, you would have this unnerving awareness of your own mortality. In the early decades of the recognition of diseases of the heart that led the heart to be weak, to not function as well, Failure was the right terminology, in part because we had no therapies to make a difference. And we still face a burden of heart failure, but a heart burden of heart failure that has been enabled by a robust number of important discoveries. So much so that it is my quest now to share with audiences, particularly public audiences, that everything you think about heart failure, every experience someone in, in your family or you have had with heart failure, everything you read on the internet when you search for heart failure, take three steps. Delete, delete, delete. <laughs> okay. Because it doesn't reflect the contemporary context. Mm -hmm. The contemporary context gives us a definition. The heart has a structural change capable of functioning as you needed to function so that you are comfortable you can do being for work but in addition to having a structural change there's already evidence that the heart is becoming inefficient 
and there are ways that we can do that. There are simple laboratory tests that can give us that information. Things we can do in an old-fashioned physical examination. I still use one of these, and for your listening audience, I'm holding up my stethoscope that's 20 years old. Mm -hmm. and it's the same thing I've used throughout my whole career, no matter what technologies I have. But I'm getting to a point. We know what the condition is. It's an abnormality of the heart that is associated with inefficient function of the heart. But we stop there because the way in which it is experienced by different groups, by women, by persons self-describes African-Americans, by older persons, is sufficiently nuanced that a contemporary physician or a care provider, thinking about an advanced practice nurse, for example, really needs to be facile with all of these different iterations of the disease process. So you're right, it is a scary term but you can exhale and understand that the fear is no longer at such a heightened level. It is a topic of concern, something you need to, to, to respect, but it is not a fatality by definition. We can treat this condition and treat it well. So how do, how do physicians go about identifying that? You said that perhaps... Um... Uh, it, it, there are different uh, ways of determining uh, if a person has heart failure, but some physicians may not be uh, familiar with the, the new nuances and the new uh, therapies or the, the new uh, diagnostic um, ways of determining that. So Mel, you um, have moved into a different space. Okay. Robin wanted us to talk about things definitionally, okay. if, if you will. Okay. But you're helping us enter into a discussion about implementation. How do you actualize this awareness of the nuances of heart failure? So just like I'm working with the two of you today, you, Robin, and you, Mel, to socialize mm -hmm. perspectives on heart failure with your listeners in a separate domain, me and many other professionals are working in the professional space to socialize these new narratives, to amplify the new discoveries, and importantly, to promulgate the new approaches. But one of the key considerations, nothing drives a physician's behavior more so than a patient or family member's mm -hmm. question. And so by having this conversation with you and by allowing you to amplify my voice and let your listeners know, if you're experiencing the onset of fatigue different than what you've experienced before, if you're experiencing frank shortness of breath, if you see that your ankles are getting puffy, if you understand that you've got a persistent cough and you don't feel like you have a fever or a cold, these are symptoms that are not due to old age or just being lazy and tired. You should be functional well into your later years. And once you begin to see, I'm no longer able to walk a certain distance, or I'm getting up in the middle of the night to simply catch my breath, I find that I'm more comfortable sleeping upright in a chair because when I get in bed and fully reclined, I'm not breathing well. Not breathing well under any circumstance, Mel. Let me be very clear. Not breathing well under any circumstance, whether it's exercise, or your position in space that is being lying or sitting, that's an issue. You don't just ride that out. It doesn't just go away. If you're not breathing well, that's the moment that you don't search the internet. You don't get on the computer. You get on the phone or you get in the car and you talk to a professional. Because there are many reasons why you might not be breathing well. But one of those is cardiac. And even the cardiac causes are not always heart failure per se, but it could be attributable to an irregular heart rhythm, or it could be a triple attributable to blood vessel disease around the heart. But don't be your own diagnostician. Don't do that. Okay, so if you're experiencing those those things that you just mentioned, uh, should uh, you know this is a risk factor for possible heart failure, and people should go in and see their physician about that. Mel, you just you you're so prescient today <laughs> because. The risk factor is how it all gets started. Okay. There's no mystery here. Mm -hmm. There's a trioka. Okay. 
diabetes, obesity, diabetes, and hypertension. I'm getting so excited talking to you because you're raising such a good question. So I start, try to say diabetes and obesity in the same word. Mm -hmm. But diabetes, mm -hmm. obesity, and hypertension. You know if you've got those three things going on. Mm -hmm. That is not a mystery. If you've got those three things going on and you're older age mm -hmm. and you start having shortness of breath, I mean, that's the flashing yellow light. Talk to someone because mm -hmm. there's a chance that's heart failure. And oh, by the way, and this gets back to the opening comment, Robin, that same trioka I just described, yeah. particularly when it's associated with shortness of breath, that awareness happens typically 15 years earlier in self-described black patients than non-black patients. 15 years earlier, typically happens in the mid 40s to early 50s, while for everyone else, it happens in the late 60s and early 70s. Mm -hmm. Think about that. Earlier onset, more symptoms, a very compelling circumstance. And unfortunately, the epidemiology that we have tells us that part of that nuanced difference is not just in the social circumstances, not just in the life and living, not just even in age of onset. It's in outcomes, Robin, meaning hospitalizations are more frequently in self-described black patients due to heart failure. And unfortunately, there appears to be still a signal of more deaths. I say that very carefully because there's so many qualifiers on that kind of information. Just the ascertainment of race from medical records can be very challenging. But the data appear to suggest that for certain hospitalizations are happening more frequently. And if it's also a risk of death, that's a concern. And you mentioned it, um, some, excuse me, Amel, uh, mm -hmm. some qualifiers. You say that you say this hesitantly because there are some qualifiers. What qualifiers would you would you say? So very good question. Quite insightful. I love that both of you were ready to speak right away because now it means I've got your attention. <laughs> oh, you have. Oh, but yeah. the, the, the qualifiers that are so critically important are first, what are the concomitant other illnesses? Robin, very few people show up with just one condition. They almost always show up with a heart condition and, oh, by the way, a kidney condition and, oh, by the way, high blood pressure. Mm -hmm. So trying to deconstruct what's really driving the outcome of concern or conversely, understanding the synergy, unfortunately, of progressive renal disease, heart disease, hypertension. All of these, I think, have to be carefully addressed when we're trying to assign cause for something like death. And so we must we must keep this in mind. And I would be remiss, terribly remiss, if I didn't put in the same discussion, not only the several other associated illnesses, the word I use is concomitant, but also make clear that access to care continues to be a troublesome issue. And it's not access to care like most people, most people would define it. I'm pleased that most people in this country can present to a hospital and receive urgent care as indicated. Okay. But what concerns me about access to care is that we have a number of people who receive less care. They have access to care, but in totality, what they receive is less care and it's that longitudinal care it's that ambulatory care it's walking in the doctor's office it is and this is the key word robin it is that preemptive care that thwarts disease it is that care that helps control the blood pressure that helps manage the obesity that helps control the diabetes that helps facilitate the cessation of smoking that is that under care experience that we worry about. Yes, we have access to care, and I applaud that. But many people are in this under care, not quite robust enough for it to, if you will, change the arc of disease. And that's important. Wow, I haven't heard that term before, but under care. Mm. So okay. yes, you can, you can put it in the context of, do you receive adequate care? If you are well insured and you're making all of your well women visits and you're having occasional 
examinations, some would call them annual physicals. I'm not sure that needs to happen on a yearly basis. We might call that adequate care. What I'm suggesting to you, Robin, is that not in a very visible way, but there are innumerable patients on a large scale that instead of receiving adequate care are receiving something that is inadequate under care. And so most of them are not getting the preemptive care, but they have access if they come in, come in presenting symptoms, then they'll be treated. So but let me give you just a blatant example. Okay. No one in this country with symptoms of a stroke will be turned away in a, in a United States hospital. Your stroke will be treated and hopefully treated in a way that we can mitigate the consequences of a stroke. Medicine has come so far and we can do that. But many patients with hypertension, a major risk factor for stroke, don't receive the adequate preemptive care, helping that patient manage the blood pressure assiduously, getting to a threshold of blood pressure control where the stroke risk is decreased. So think about the scenario I've just said. For that urgent crisis care, yes, you have access to care. Let's applaud. But for the really important care, the care that prevents ever having to present with the acute stroke. That's where this under care or inadequate care or lesser care, use the synonym you enjoy most, but it's still the same phenomenon. We have a scenario where some people just don't get idealized care, optimal care to prevent disease. And that's not just for the stroke now, that's for the heart attack. That's for the onset of heart failure. Because let me just say when a patient presents in the hospital, with heart failure. That's what, that is scary. You used that word before. That is scary because you really can't breathe. You're in a hospital and we know now with such great clarity, if you are hospitalized with heart failure, that is your symptoms are so profound that you require hospitalization. That unfortunately is a negative pivot in your life. That changes your life expectancy. That changes your quality of living. Mm -hmm. Well, what can a person do? I mean, are, are we supposed to monitor our bodies in the sense that uh, we um, uh, recognize these symptoms that you're talking about or these issues uh, of inability to do this, to walk distances, things like you were talking about? So, or Mel, this is great. You've just given me the segue that I hoped you would give us. Okay. Because anyone listening to this, and I'm delighted that you've got a legacy you now, you have an audience and they're engaged with these kinds of deeper conversations. So for the listeners, I'm speaking to you. These are the steps that you can take of your own volition to preserve your health. Okay. Don't smoke. Be physically active. I'm not suggesting you have to join a gym or buy spandex. Just be physically active. Walking in particular, very important. Know your weight and make certain your weight is appropriate for your height. Not everybody needs a weight the same, but let me just be very clear. Any woman less than 200 pounds or more, you are obese. There is no height other than about six foot eight inches, which allows 200 pounds to be a normal weight for a woman. You are obese, medical obese, and I'm sure you're very attractive, but you are obese and you need to think about losing your weight and then follow a heart healthy diet. Don't think about the no's in your diet. Think about the yeses. Enjoy fruits, enjoy vegetables, enjoy lean red meat, enjoy fish, enjoy chicken. If it is your preference to opt for a plant-based diet, please do so, that's very healthy. If it's your preference to be a vegetarian, please do so. Think about the healthy fats. Think about olive oil, think about nuts, think about beans. Listen to the way that I position this. Think about the yeses, not the noes. So you start with those four behaviors, if you will, not smoking, being physically active, knowing your weight, right-sizing your weight, and then following a heart-healthy diet. Now, what about other markers about which you should need, about which you should be aware? Know your blood pressure, know your blood sugar, know your blood cholesterol level. Let me be incredibly clear in this. I am confident that everyone listening, I'm still talking to the listeners, knows your cell phone number, 
without any hesitation. You can recite it. In three seconds, can you do the same thing? You do the same thing for your cholesterol. Can you do the same thing for your blood sugar? You should be able to do that. You should have that kind of self-awareness. Socially, we talk about self self-awareness all the time. That's all good, but the real self-awareness you need to have are your measures of health. So I've given you seven things so far. I've given you four behaviors: smoking, activity, weight, and diet. And I've given you three markers: blood pressure, cholesterol, blood sugar. But here's the critical next variable sleep it's so incredibly important your body recuperates when you sleep particularly if you get into what's called slow wave sleep your body is restored it improves your cognitive function your level of alertness it actually helps you with your weight management it improves your metabolism so i've just given every listener eight steps towards better health I'm a national spokesperson for the American Heart Association and a former president of the American Heart Association 11 years ago. But this is what we call the essential eight. If you embrace the essential eight, the closer you get to all eight, the more likely you are to avoid cardiovascular disease, the more likely you are to avoid certain cancers, the more likely you are to live a longer, happier, healthier life. Who don't want to sign up for that? Eight things. Don't smoke, be active, learn your weight, have a good diet, learn your blood pressure, your cholesterol, your blood sugar, and get some sleep, folks. That's it. Now, if we transition from that now, I wanted to be certain, and thank you again for the segue, that we were able to articulate to the entire listening audience what's necessary for you to embrace health. And that has no bearing on race or sex or gender or ethnicity. That's just the truth for the human soul. Okay. But if we're talking about any cardiovascular condition, pay attention to how you feel. If you're beginning to vary from a sense of wellness, maybe it's your blood pressure. Maybe it's heart failure. I hope it's not. Maybe it's atherosclerosis. I hope it's not. But don't hesitate to speak up, to check. Pay attention to your family history. What did your grandparents have? Did they experience heart disease? Do your parents have heart disease? If you've got siblings, talk to each other. Hey, what's your blood pressure doing? Anyone ever talk to you about heart disease? If you find that there's a history in your family of strokes or heart attacks, don't think you're the lucky one. Be proactive. Step up and say, I wanna know. And that first step is painless. It's checking the blood pressure, it's checking the cholesterol, it's checking your weight. That's the thing to do. And one last thing about weight, I know that our time is getting short. Everybody wants to know what's the right diet, what's the magic pill, what's the secret? There's one secret. It's one secret. Now, Robin and Mel, I want you to lean in a little bit yeah, so yeah. I can tell you the secret. There's only one secret. It's portion control. Portion. Think about what you eat now. Whatever you eat right now, are you able to eat maybe only 80% of this? I'm going to make both of you smile. It's nice that I can see you and get your feedback. There's this phenomenon in the world called the Blue Zones. And what's characteristic about the Blue Zones, there's five communities in the world, five, but the Blue Zones. What's characteristic about those communities is that people typically live into their 90s, even into their hundreds. So what are they doing in those five communities that's not happening in the rest of the world? They have these wonderful commonalities without even talking to each other. They just kind of happen upon it. But their diets are calorie restricted. They are physically active. But they do one other thing that I think is really impressive. They follow the 80% rule. They only eat to 80% satiety. They're never that Thanksgiving day full. And you know what I'm talking about now. Yeah. They're never that Thanksgiving day full. Yeah. They eat to 80% of their satiety, meaning feeling full. But there are two other things they do that I think are so precious. And I do mean to use that word precious. They are in social networks where they have the spirit of being able to collaborate, having a knowingness of others. It could be friends, it could be family. 
and they're able to understand their value in life. So if you have a sense that your life is valuable to somebody else because of who you are, what you do, and you're in a network of people that are supportive, those are secrets to longevity. And you do everything else we talk about, you'll live a good life and the world will be a better place. Wow. Well, suppose someone in our audience or others, many in our audience have already have these issues. They're already overweight. They, uh, you know, are not sleeping correctly and all these. Is it possible to reverse that and and get back on a good plane? Mel, I don't know how you've done this, but somehow or another you've immersed yourself into my reference library, uh, my email <laughs> inbox, or my whole assortment of prior presentations that are all evidence-based, by the way. The data are this. Regardless of your current age or burden of risk, thinking about obesity, diabetes, hypertension, there is no point in time where you can't change your health. You can always change your health and reap a benefit from it. So if that stuff's already embedded, that's your reality, fine. But you can make an effort beginning this day going forward to lose the weight, to stop smoking, to control your blood pressure. For every kilogram of weight loss, that's 2.2 pounds, Mel, your blood pressure goes down by a point. Okay. Now, if you get 10 kilograms of weight loss, no matter what weight you're starting, your blood pressure goes down by 10 points. That's enough to change your burden of disease. And you do that all on your own by changing your behavior. And here's another thing, Robin. In the beginning, we, we talked about the different partitions of what determines disease as a function of race. And I said, there's a small amount that might be attributable to your genetics. And self-described Black persons or African-Americans attributable to African ancestry. But everybody has a genetic history. We understand this, that even when you are genetically predisposed to have heart disease, guess what? A heart healthy lifestyle, even in a setting of genetic risk, dramatically lowers your burden of disease. Mm -hmm. So it's not a fail complete that because you have a genetic risk, you'll have the disease. But it's a higher bar. It's an imperative to adopt these lifestyle circumstances. So I love that you're thinking about this, Robin, because I hope that I'm giving you some almost disruptive thoughts that you've not had before. And by the way, I got three more minutes with you. So what's your question? <laughs> okay. Yeah, there is um one thing one thing you didn't didn't mention. I was trying to find that one thing. What about controlling stress? Perfect that question. Perfect question. We have evidence now. The stress is not just some kind of vaporish thing where I feel stressed today. We understand stress is biological. We understand that stress is manifest as a signal of inflammation. To help you understand what inflammation is, if you or I get an insect bite, that mm -hmm. area of redness on your skin around the bite, that area of skin is inflamed. Inflammation in your body is not a good thing. And imagine what happens when the inflammation is systemic throughout your vessels, throughout your cardiovascular system that has a bearing on disease. So now we're closing with where we started. What is it about a life and living circumstance that predisposes to more disease? What is it about living in a community where there's been disinvestment? What is it when you have housing density that's not ideal, when you don't have good employment opportunities, when you don't have good educational opportunities, don't have good transportation opportunities, don't have free spaces where you can roam and be physically active outdoors in a safe way? All of that, Robin, engenders stress. And that stress becomes manifest as blood vessel thickening, as an increase in blood pressure, as inflammation, which starts a cascade of events that leads to the early onset of disease. And I meant to say early onset. You know why I meant to say that, Robin? Because this starts in children. Hmm. In children? From what, age 10? 10 or 5? Younger. Younger. <laughs> We call them adverse childhood experiences. And when children experience adverse childhood experiences, single parent home, abuse, when substance abuse, alcoholism, when children are in that environment, each of those singular adverse childhood experiences, we call them ACEs, starts this cascade of stress. And it has a manifestation on their biology. 
so that by the time they're early aged adults, some of these risk factors are already set in place. This is going to floor you, Robin, but think about the young black women you might know who are 30-ish. One third of them already have high blood pressure, mm. but probably haven't had their blood pressure checked unless it's been pregnancy related. Mm -hmm. At 30, one third. Wow. Oh my goodness. Yeah. The one, one other thing too, you did bring up uh, about alcoholism. What about alcohol use in general? Oh, I've got to come clean and tell you that um, I love red wine. And there's not an evening that goes by, including last evening, where I don't have um, at least a half glass of red wine with my dinner at night. Or because I just enjoy it, and I'm hoping that there really is. Modest is probably the correct way to calibrate that. And it's too easy to go past one glass. But um, that's a softer sort of conversation. If you enjoy wine like I do, there may be a modest health benefit. Um, if you don't drink, don't start drinking just so you can get a modest benefit. Anyway, in the last minute, Mel, it's been so fun engaging with you and I love how you've been in lockstep with the way I think. So let me give you the final opportunity. What's the one space we haven't covered that you'd like for me to cover? Well, uh, one of the things I'd like for you to tell our audience is you know, what what would you, of all the things that you talked about, what's the one or two things that you would want them to take away that's really critical and important? And one other thing, too, how much sleep is enough sleep? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. So for a general audience, I'll say this to really truncate it. Do more, be physically active, eat less. Everybody can stand to lose some weight know your numbers your blood pressure in particular and your hours of sleep at night for an adult that's probably seven hours children need more sleep older persons typically need more sleep mm -hmm. but in the big metal it's probably seven hours but no less than six hours know your numbers and get enough sleep Yay. <laughs> so, Robin, I have to go and refill my dark rubs. Okay. Thank you very much for this opportunity to visit with you. Yeah. I'm at the end of my tea also. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm probably going to go for a double, but yeah. Thank you so much. <laughs> really, Asante Sana, doc, Dr. Uh, Dr. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Yancey, I'm tired. It's, it's this is amazing. Here. <laughs> yeah. This, I'm just floored by so much of this. Yeah. And this has been very, very helpful. Very helpful. Really appreciate it. Great talking to a doctor. I did want to ask you about the A1C numbers and about cortisol, but you have to go. So I won't do that. <laughs> oh, I, I can tell you very quickly. Um, you really want an A1C less than seven. Um, if you have diabetes closer to six, but not less than six, um, mm -hmm. particularly if you achieve that with medical therapists, there may be some risk there. And cortisol probably is one of the mediators of this whole phenomenon of stress. Again, getting from kind of the experiential understanding of stress, I feel stressed out, to the biological expression of stress. Amongst the many mediators, and there are a number that have been identified, cortisol is in that bucket. Mm. Okay. Okay. So know that number then too. And uh, all right. No, not know that number. Know that risk. That risk. Understand that when you feel stress, it's not just that you feel stress, it's that your body is stressing and that mm. process. It's a stress scene. It's a laborious audience that can't relate with that one <laughs> word, hormones. While the hormones do more than control your bodies and have you feel as a woman should feel and have me because of testosterone feel as a man should feel. We all are familiar with hormones, but we don't extend that familiarity to a whole nother suite, S-U-I-T-E, of hormones that impact our health with cortisol mm. being just one of those. Okay. So you've got a bonus question in, Rob, and I, I caught did. that. <laughs> I appreciate that. <laughs> I stuck it in. <laughs> yes. Yeah, All right. Listen, yeah, I you really so want much. you guys to have a wonderful day. This has thank been very helpful. Much. Thank you. Really thank appreciate you. it. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Bye, -bye. Bye. Bye. Well, this ends today's discussion with Dr. Clyde Yancey. Alifia Espresso Talk Today community, it's Alma Robin again. 
First, I want to begin by saying a big asante sana to Dr. Clancy for giving us his time and his energy and his expertise about this important, important issue. Thank you so much, Dr. Clancy. I was thinking that we really should call this a black empowerment discussion because as I said earlier, black health is black empowerment. And Dr. Yancey gave us tools and knowledge that can empower us to work towards optimal health. Let's just recap a few points. Dr. Yancey noted that, and this is a quote, heart failure is a topic of concern, something we need to respect, but it is not a fatality by definition. We can treat this condition and we can treat it well, end quote. That's great news, but we still need to take certain symptoms very seriously and see a doctor. What are those symptoms? Dr. Yancey said that, but I'm gonna repeat them here. Let's listen up. Fatigue, the onset of fatigue that's different from what you normally experience. Number two, shortness of breath. Number three, persistent cough without a fever or cold. And number four, swollen ankles. Pay close attention to these symptoms. Don't just write them out. Don't get on the internet and look there. Don't be your own diagnostician. Don't try to diagnose yourself. See your doctor. You might not have heart failure. There might be some other reason. There might be something else on the horizon. There might be nothing. But see your doctor as soon as possible. Dr. Yancey also discussed three risk factors for cardiovascular disease three risk factors. Do you remember them? Mel asked about them and I'm so glad she did because these factors are really prevalent in the black community. And actually they're prevalent throughout Western society as Dr. Yancey mentioned at the beginning of the show. What are those three factors? Number one, obesity. Number two, diabetes. Number three, hypertension. Obesity, diabetes, hypertension. So if you have one or more of these risk factors, or you start having symptoms, shortness of breath, swollen ankles, persistent cough, unusual fatigue, see so your doctor right away. No need to wait. And if you're a black, these symptoms can appear 15 years earlier than they appear in white people. For black people, the onset can appear in the mid 40s or the, or the early 50s. Dr. Yancey described heart failure as a very nuanced illness. It's not a one size fits all disease and every treatment will not fit everyone. Af African Americans, older people, younger people, women, each will have a different experience with the illness and a contemporary physician will need to know the different presentation of the illness. Remember Dr. Yancey's words about heart failure. We can treat this condition and we can treat it well. That is a quote. We can treat this condition and we can treat it well, but you have to go to a doctor. You cannot treat this illness yourself. And this really is great news. But remember those symptoms, fatigue, shortness of breath, persistent cough, swollen ankles. Also remember that Dr. Yancey is a cardiologist, a former president of the American Heart Association and national spokesman for the American Heart Association. So if he says this is what you need to do for heart health, then this really is what you need to do. He also says that these symptoms, these steps can help you to avoid certain can cancers and to live longer, live happier lives and live healthier lives. That's what we all want, right? Dr. Yancey says, that you need to do these eight essential steps for optimal health. Eight steps. Here they are. Don't smoke. Number two, be active. Number three, maintain a healthy weight. Number four, eat a healthy diet. Number five, maintain good blood pressure. Number six, maintain good cholesterol. Number seven, have the right level of blood sugar. And number eight, get enough sleep. That's it. 
that is what's necessary for optimum health. Some of these are a bit more difficult than others for certain people. We all have our challenges. But this just means that we need to work a little bit harder in certain areas because your health really can depend on it. Finally, and this is really important, Dr. Yancey discussed one issue that is not often discussed by doctors. Many people, particularly black people, are receiving inadequate medical care, meaning that we receive less care than our risk factors or our symptoms require. This is called undercare. Undercare. I had never heard that term before this discussion, but I can absolutely see how it affects black health. Undercare is an issue even when people have full access to health care. But undercare ignores or fails to address symptoms, risk factors, or lifestyle issues before they can turn into disease. You know, I think that undercare could also involve other forms of undertreatment, such as failing to prescribe pro proper medication for pain, downplaying treatments like physical therapy that can help people live more independently, delaying doctor's appointments or surgeries, or failing to recognize and address mental health issues. Many doctors also fail to discuss with their patients their range of treatment options. These are all under care, and they can have a negative effect on our health. I am so happy that Dr. Yancey addressed the issue of under care. Just because you may have access to health care does not always mean that you're receiving the appropriate level of care. So let's take the issue of under care very seriously, especially as black folks, and pursue the health care that is right for you. Again, I want to say a big asante sana to Dr. Clyde Yancey for sharing his valuable time with us to discuss cardiovascular disease and heart health. And I say asante sana to Mel and to you, my community, for being in the building with me today. We are so grateful for your support. You really are the reason that we do what we do every single day. Dr. Yancey has taught us a lot today. And as Maya Angelou once said, when you know better, you can do better. With this information, we can help ourselves and help each other to take the steps to live longer, healthier, and happier lives. We all can do better. Black health is Black empowerment. We hope that you are feeling that empowerment and sharing it as well. We are a community and we can work together. This is the end of our show with Dr. Clyde Yancey. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me at team at espressotalktoday.com or on Instagram at ama robin l. That's the letter L. I also encourage you to check out the website of the Association of Black Cardiologists. They have great health-related information and a directory so that you can find a trusted black cardiologist in your area. And also, of course, check out the American Heart Association website. They also have great information and they can help you find a doctor too. You can find all this information and links on these organizations, this important, the important risk factors we talked about earlier, and those never ignore symptoms on the Habari page of the Espresso Talk Today website, espressotalktoday.com. You'll also find this information on my Instagram page at Ama Robin L. There's a lot of information in both places because we really wanted to make it easy for you to find it and to use it. I'm Amal Robin for the Espresso Talk Today podcast show. And remember, now more than ever, strength, soul, and reparations. Ashe community. <laughs>